getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, especially because we're always growing and changing. Been through a lot of changes, know what that's like, and sometimes you just need someone's help walking you through it. This is where services like BetterHelp come in and are so handy. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Blair today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com, H-E-L-P.com slash Blair. And thank you so much to BetterHelp for sponsoring another episode of The Blair White Project. And now on to the rest of the podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to The Blair White Project. I feel like every episode lately, I am opening it with a gun haul because I'm just on a gun buying kick. You guys know that LA Blair collected designer purses and Texas Blair connect collects fun guns. Uh, so have a couple new purchases. This is the first one. This is my PS90. It's really hard to fit her in the frame of the podcast for the uh, YouTube viewers, but I am so excited to shoot her today. I'm actually taking her out um, and she takes 50 rounds. The next one I'm going to show you also does, uh, which I'm excited about because I don't think I have many guns that take 50 rounds. Um, and because you guys know, I also got the Chris Vector. I showed that last time, have not shot that one yet either. Taking that one out directly after I shoot this podcast, super excited and I just love her. Let me know if I should color her. I'm kind of just feeling keeping her black. I know that's like a bit shocking for me because I'd be painting all my guns ridiculous colors, but she looks sexy black, but you never know. She may be transracial. And if that's the case, if she wants to change her color, who am I to stop her of all people? Oh, you can't change, but I can change. Okay. Uh, and next we have the Caltech P50. This is like some like, I don't even know. It looks kind of like space, like a space gun, but also not super sexy. Another 50 rounds, uh, have not shot her shooting her today. Um, I really love Caltech. You guys know I have the Caltech KSG and the fire engine red, uh, and I'm excited to shoot her as well. This one, I think I definitely do want to color. I think I definitely want to do her teal because I don't have any teal guns and how sick would this be teal? Also, how sick would it be? I like Loki don't fuck with the trans flag. But like it would be kind of sickening to have like a trans colored gun just for the shits and giggles of it. So I may do that. So if you see me with a trans colored gun, don't ask questions. Y'all know I'm trans. All right. So that is the uh gun haul for today. But we have a lot to talk about, you guys. Uh we're gonna be talking about Jazz Jennings. People have been wanting me to talk about Daz Jennings for my entire career. And I've really held off because oh, my contact lens is messing up because I just feel bad for Jazz. I feel like Jazz is a victim of so many things, a victim in so many ways. Um, but here's the thing. I always we will get to Jazz. I always find myself not wanting to talk about certain things. But then like when the whole Internet is talking about it, it's like, why would I let other people run away with my bag like why do all these other conservative commentators just get to talk about Dad Jennings all day but I'm sitting here with some like moral reason why I'm not when I'm not even gonna be mean to her anyways I'm ranting Jazz Jennings we're talking about only fans regret a lot of the girls I'm talking about real girls um are regretting doing only fans and coming forward about it and I think that's an important story to tell because we only hear about how awesome it is you got to hear both sides uh Texas is banning child sex changes people want me to be mad about that why uh, and we're going to react to some woke TikToks and I have um, a segment where I'm going to be answering you guys' questions. But let's get into it with a white pill for the first thing. I have seen so many trans people waking the F up lately about this community and speaking out. And, you know, I feel as though considering for so long I was the only one, it is my responsibility to not hold the ladder up. Like if I see people trying to come in and and help me make sense of all of this or not even help me, maybe you don't like me, but you want to fix it in your own way. And if you're doing it in a way I respect, I respect it. But I want to share these videos. So this trans woman named Bella Joy made a video about me last night and I saw it while I was sitting in bed a little um, not sober, just relaxing, chilling in bed, you know what I mean? Uh, a little... <laughs> 
And it made me so emotional. I wanted to just react to it really quick, or at least a segment of it. So this is Bella Joy. Her video is I Stand with Blair White. This community is a mess. Yes, it is, sis. As you can tell by the title of this video, um, I stand with Blair White. I just like didn't really know what else to um, title this video. I also felt like I couldn't vocalize and say the opinions that I genuinely felt out of fear of losing an audience that like I worked really hard to get. I've been listening to Blair White's podcast a lot lately. And now you're she on kind it. of continuously makes a statement that trans women, trans people in the community really do need to stand up and need to really say their opinions and their thoughts. Like she's constantly getting messages and constantly getting DMs from people saying that they agree with what she's doing, but don't actually speak out about it themselves. And so I really just can't be one of those people anymore. Um, and when I say I stand with Blair White, I may not stand with every single little thing that she says or agrees with or political stances or everything. But overarchingly, like I totally agree with her. And honestly, this fucking community is a bunch of goddamn clowns. Like literally, like I'm so actually embarrassed sometimes like so embarrassed about like the trans community and it's not even like specifically like trans people but it's like the they thems the non-binaries right. the this the that the all the letters getting added like it's just become a fucking mess and so that's just a short clip from the video for which it is 12 minutes please go watch it please go subscribe to her show her support um I think it's very brave of her to <laughs> say anything positive about me coming from the trans community. You know, a lot of the girls, when they say that they like me, they get attacked. You know, I see it all the time. Like I'll get posted in on maybe like certain like trans, um, there's like certain like trans like tea pages. It's like, you know, I have like the shade room. There's like trans versions of that. And they'll post my clips or they'll post me. And it's a very mixed reaction. A lot of the girls get very, very upset. So it's not as if she's not taking somewhat of an L even speaking positively of me. But I think it goes to show that there really is a tide shifting. You know, I've been very depressed. Okay, let me just open up with y'all. Because a lot of you guys have been writing with me since the beginning, right? The beginning of me coming on YouTube. You've seen the ups and downs of like society and the world and trans shit and my trajectory, all that. I have been very much in a deep, dark depression. I think because of the trans stuff recently, I kind of figured that out. There's other stuff going on in my life too, but a big part of it is the trans stuff is just such a mess. You know, after the Nashville tragedy, I just felt like it hit such a fever pitch that, you know, it felt like hopeless. And I felt um, for the first time in my life very much ashamed of being trans, which is irrational because how am I supposed to feel guilt over the actions of another human being? However, you know, uh, it's just a lot of negative stuff coming out about trans right now and trans ideology. And like Bella Joy said in the video, a lot of people who aren't even trans making it look bad. So I kind of realized like, how am I going to sit here and let myself feel gross about being trans when I know that these people who are identifying this way and behaving poorly are by and large not even trans, but it has put me just in an icky space. And you guys are so in tune with me that I know a lot of you guys have seen that. And, um, Whenever I'm even a little bit down, you guys notice and you message me and like, we're just so in sync, right? Uh, my supporters and I. But you know, lately I'm actually coming out of that depression because yes, the Nashville thing brought everything to a fever pitch and the Bud Light thing and all just the, everything, right? But the result of it is something actually um, awesome, which is every day I'm following a new conservative trans account you don't got to be conservative to be you know combating the insanity in the community just based trans people on twitter on instagram so many more i've been adding into i've been added into group chats where there's like 50 of them at a piece and they're all gaining followers on twitter you know this girl posting publicly i stand with blair white it's like wow you know i think things had to get so bad for things to start getting better and what i'm seeing is that 
trans people who just want to live their lives normally, want to integrate with society, don't want to be seen as or behave like deviants are really stepping up. And, you know, these deviants are louder. They are more violent. They are more aggressive because they're deviants. But we're going to take this crap back. Like we are going to take the community back. We got Buck Angel. We got Kelly Cadigan. We got Marcus Dibbs, who got unbanned, by the way. In the last podcast, we talked about how he was banned. He's unbanned. Um, I'm just feeling good about this new faction of the trans community that is waking up. And even though there still is such a stigma of being publicly supportive of me and being a trans person, I feel like that stigma is wearing off and that that is a positive thing. So shout out to Bella Joy. Next. (laughs) Jazz Jennings. Okay. So this article says Jazz Jennings hits back at conservative commentators for spreading harmful attacks. Now, if you don't know... Jazz Jennings is basically the most famous trans child in the world. And her story has been very public for um, almost her entire life. You know, she was being interviewed by Barbara Walters at like, what, three, four or five years old uh, about how she was trans all the way back then. And she's had a reality show on TLC, which is the freak show channel. They got MILF Manor. They got 9 Day Fiance. Like, it's just not a good look to even be trans. Like the 600 pound life, like not even a good look to be trans on the TLC channel, but Regardless, she's had a reality show that has documented her entire transition, her family, um, and that has entailed showing the surgeries. And, you know, when I look at jazz, I have to be very honest. I see a broken person. I see a person who has been used, abused, and profited off of by obviously TLC and the media but also the parents, you know, I don't know what kind of parents put their kid in a Barbara Walters interview at five years old. You know, it's just that to me is just wild. Uh, you know, there's a lot of really sad clips about Jazz's emotions and a lot of those clips to give context to what this war is about with her reacting to conservative commentators like uh, Ben Shapiro, Matt Walsh, Candace Owens, Lauren Chen, is that a lot of people are... In my opinion, even though I do feel that Jazz was abused and she should have never gotten a sex change underage, I do not believe she could have consented to that. I believe something was done to her she could not have consented to. A lot of people are taking her story out of context, finding these clips of her talking about being sad and writing headlines like Jazz Jennings regrets her transition. I saw Tim Pool do a whole video, Jazz Jennings transition regret, and I'm like, she never, ever came out as a detransitioner. She never, ever said she regretted her transition, right? And so I feel like to take that out of context does a big disservice to the fact that there are a lot of detransitioners out there. We don't have to make a detransition story out of someone who isn't, right? For all we know, Jazz is happy with her transition. Do I believe she really could have consented to that as a minor? No. Do I believe that was right? No. Does that mean Jazz Jennings regrets it? No. You're not in her heart and her mind and writing, you know, Titles like that does a disservice to a very real conversation about real detransitioners. However, I do think her family is demented. I think that anyone who puts their child and sets them out to be a reality star, a celebrity, a spokesperson for something like this, their incentive, something's not clean in the milk. Like something's not clean, right? It's like not good. And this is the same with, okay, so you think about child stars, right, in general, like actors, actresses, and these are people that get all the, like, glory and none of the, you know, like, toxicity of being famous for representing something like trans and being part of that debate, right? And they thrust their kid into that, right? And Jazz Jennings actually is, in many ways, a very good example of why child transitioners why transitioning as a child is not the best thing for children, even when they believe they are transgender, even when they are experiencing gender dysphoria, because jazz will never be able to orgasm. Jazz never experienced puberty. Jazz was put on puberty blockers, hormones, and surgery without ever experiencing puberty, which means she can never, ever orgasm. That's the first thing. And people... People love to gaslight when you, you, when you bring that up and they're like, well, why are you talking about teenagers orgasming? I'm talking about human beings being robbed of a function they have a natural born right to. That's what I'm talking about. So you're not going to gaslight me into making me feel weird for talking about someone else's orgasm when sex is a part of life and to rob a human being of that is, is 
demented. It's the devil. It's evil. You know, it, it, it's really, really scary. Um, especially considering like there are so many trans women that don't go through with a sexual reassignment surgery because they still want to be healthy adults with healthy sex lives. Can you necessarily not have that if you have SRS? I don't know. I've met some that do, some that don't. But for a child to decide, that doesn't make sense. The second thing is because Jazz never went through puberty, Jazz never developed enough of a penis to actually turn into a neo-vagina. Jazz had a micro penis. And if you know anything about SRS, which many people don't, but one of the things you should know is that the depth of the vaginal canal is the dire- is directly correlated to the length of the penis you start with because you're turning it inside out. A lot of people think it's a snip snip. It's not a snip snip. You're turning it inside out. And if you don't have that length, then you're not going to have that depth, which is a very like ew, skeevy whatever, you know, but it's like whatever. Uh, <laughs> so the fact is, If puberty blockers are really like the medically necessary and suggested route for trans kids, she had to get like two or three revision surgeries and had all these complications because she never developed to get a neo-vagina. So even their most famous trans, like this is the poster child for people who support uh, children transitioning, right? Is Jazz Jennings. They gave her a show. They got on every platform. She's doing all these sponsorships for trans people and whatever. And even she was having all these complications because the route that she took medically, which is the medically suggested route that they are putting all these kids through now, screwed her. And I just feel really bad about that. You know, Jazz is not a bad person. And I see people saying horrible things about Jazz. And the argument is that, we know, Jazz is an adult now, so Jazz should be held accountable for promoting child transition. And I guess there's something to that. But at the same time, I cannot imagine the trauma of being forced into fame and surgery and never being able to develop properly in your mind, never allowing your brain to develop through puberty um, and being thrust into the limelight in that specific way and what that does to your brain and so in my opinion jazz gets a pass for almost anything just based on the fact that i feel truly bad for jazz i feel like the parents are demented a lot of people bring up this clip and we're going to play it because it is it is it is disturbing they tend to go back to old patterns i have woken jazz out of a dead sleep and taken the dilator and put the lubrication on it and said here you take this and you put it in your vagina if not i will But Jazz is bad, even when I'm home once a day. I will be so mad if if she goes away to college and that thing seals up. I will wring her neck. Can you imagine? So it's very understandable why people see that clip and have an adverse negative reaction to it, right? Because it's effing disturbing it's a mother talking about forcing her child to stick something in themselves now i saw tim pool saying that we should call for the arrest of the parents in this situation tagging desantis tagging christina pashaw his uh press secretary who's amazing by the way i met her um a few months back in miami and she was just such a fun time and such a delight i love her and she is very um The way she tackles trans issues very much aligns with me. She doesn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. She doesn't have an issue with adults. She has an issue with kids being abused, right? Um, And she actually told me that um, around the office, like DeSantis' office, people have shared like the Jessica and Eve debate as a way to like understand trans stuff and like understand the juxtaposition between a real trans person and like what Jessica and Eve is, which is cool. But anyways, um, as much as I think the parents are demented, I do think in some ways they're a victim as well. You have an entire medical establishment telling these parents that if their kid doesn't do these things, their kid's going to delete themselves. And I, so this is twofold, right? The idea that they put their kid out and sought fame over this is disgusting and that makes them monsters. Part of me, and people may disagree with me, part of me does withhold from calling them monsters for allowing the child to transition because people or putting them through that because people need to understand that these parents are victims in many ways too. So they have this kid who is experiencing, you know, gender nonconformity or talking about wanting to be a boy or a girl. 
you take them to a therapist, you take them to a doctor, and these doctors are giving you this insane ultimatum, which is a lie, right? It's a false dichotomy that you either have a, a dead kid or a trans kid. That's a false dichotomy, and that's setting that kid up for that paradigm. <laughs> but I don't know what I would do if I wasn't as educated on this issue as I am. If I came into it blind and took my kid to a doctor and they said that, I don't know what I would do. Because we know the doctors are full of lies. So the doctor's going to tell you that puberty blockers are the right thing, that surgery is the right thing, that hormones are the right thing for kids. And then you go on the internet, the internet's going to lie. The internet's going to censor the truth. So it's hard for me not to look at these parents in some ways as a victim as well. And yes, they were adults. And yes, they should have had the wherewithal to not allow their child to go through with this or have the child wait until they're an adult, which is what I believe is the right thing to do. Like if these feelings persist into your adulthood, do what you want, right? But I think it's just a messed up situation. And I see people saying, um, you know, that this mom is basically like committing SA sexual assault against jazz by forcing the dilator into jazz. Um, listen, jazz had the surgery. That is the way that you maintain the result of the surgery. That is the way that you, uh, what's the word? That is the aftercare that you have to do for a surgery. So do I think it's demented to happen in the first place? Yes. Do I think the surgery sells a, a promise that it doesn't, you know, match up to you? Yes. However, if I was a parent and I already put my kid through that, I'm going to make sure they're doing the aftercare. And if that involves dilation, yeah. Because what's worse than giving your kid a neovagina that doesn't live up to its, to its expectations? Probably that neovagina closing up because you're not taking care of it afterwards, right? So it's it's just a messed up situation. She should be encouraging Jazz to dilate. You went and got the surgery. You should have never got it. But now you did. You got to take care of it. Because you're going to have a whole, a whole host of other complications if you don't keep it open. So again, this is just a situation where multiple things can be true at once, but I think overall Jazz Jennings, whether she knows it or not, and she doesn't seem to, is a victim. And I just feel really bad for her. I don't like the attacks on her, uh, but I also get it because this, this story is represents a lot. This episode of the Blair White Project is sponsored by BetterHelp. A lot of people have a lot of strong opinions about therapy, certain cultures, and certain people think that it's, you know, useless or doesn't help, or it's maybe embarrassing or a bit, uh, you know, taboo to do, but I'm a big supporter of therapy. Getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, especially because we're always growing and changing. I can think of more than one moment in my life where I was turning a page into a different chapter and I just needed someone's help to walk me through it and I definitely utilize therapy. I don't think anything is wrong with that. Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we act the way we do until we talk through things. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. It's a great alternative to conventional therapy settings that some people just may not be comfortable with. Maybe not everyone wants to sit on a couch in a dusty office somewhere and sit in traffic to get there, and they want to do it from the convenience and safety of their own home. And that's why BetterHelp is so great. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Blair today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Blair. And thank you so much to BetterHelp for being an amazing sponsor to the Blair White Project. And now on to the rest of the podcast episode. Moving on to some other victims. Uh, you're not always a victim if you do this, but Again, I'm not a black and white person. I have nuanced opinions. OnlyFans creators have trouble dating and holding down relationships, according to a report. OnlyFans creators say they struggle to maintain relationships as it turns out having a sleazy side job, this is a bias article, in the name of female empowerment can have a negative impact on the quality of life. According to a survey conducted by FX Hub, among the 500 adult content creators that participated, 47% found dating to be challenging, while 42% said their relationships ended after they had disclosed their jobs to their partners. 46% reported that being an OnlyFans creator prevented them from maintaining healthy relationships and 31% said the financial earnings they made resulted in jealousy from their partners. I fully believe this. Um, you know, 
this is the side of it. I think that the lack of nuance that a lot of people on the left have about doing sex work, about doing OnlyFans and how, you know, it's just a net positive and it's super empowering and that's the end all be all. The same way they say trans women are women, that's the end all be all. Okay, well, as with everything else that leftists preach, there is some truth underneath the surface that if you care to scratch it, you can maybe see some downsides. Um, and this is one of them, you know, it's like, this is the case with, I can speak to, you know, trans women for sure it's like trans women a lot of them do sex work this is the majority of trans women i've ever known um i most trans women i have known in my life have done some form of sex work and now it includes only fans which is better than escorting and prostitution i have to admit it's a lot safer uh to just do that from the privacy of your own home and film it but they have a lot of trouble struggles finding relationships because of that you know even men who are attracted to trans women don't want that and that's the same with women as well and i just think it's important to talk about that another thing people don't talk about is that a lot of these only fans girls are way broker than they lead on i feel like every only fans person i hear talk about their earnings i'm like oh so all of you guys are making a hundred thousand dollars a month how's that a thing all of y'all cannot be making a hundred grand a month like that's just not and i'm looking at you and you're wearing forever 21 you're not making 100 grand a month. And it turns out this is the case because according to a new study, this article says, no, you won't get rich quick on OnlyFans. The math behind the fool's gold rush. So it says making about $2,500 a month on OnlyFans puts you in the top 1%, which is kind of shocking because I would say making $2,500 a month on YouTube probably puts you in like the top... For creators, I'm not talking about everyone who just has a YouTube account, people who make it their like whole job. I would say maybe earning $2,500 a month on YouTube puts you in the top like 40% of people who do it full time. Not everyone with an account, but people who do that for their living. Um, so to be in the top 1% and only making $2,500 a month, it's crazy. You see these OnlyFans creators and like in people's Instagram bios, they'll be advertising, I'm in the top 1%. And I'm like, so you're sucking and fucking for three grand? Not necessarily the glamorous life I would want, right? Like I don't judge it, first of all. I'm not anti people who do OnlyFans. I'm just pro reality. And I feel like these things should be talked about because People talk about it like it's something different. So it says making about $2,500 a month on OnlyFans puts you in the top 1% of creators. That might sound like a lot. It really doesn't. But it adds up to about $15 an hour. And that's all pre-tax. Yeah, $2,500 a month is not a lot. That's McDonald's. That's working at Starbucks, right? Maybe working like full-time at Starbucks. Picking up an extra shift or two. You get 20, like what? In other words, you can make the same amount working at Chipotle. And OnlyFans doesn't even have guacamole, right? <laughs> and again, this is the top 1%. It's more likely that a college football player makes it to the NFL than it is for an OnlyFans worker to make as much as a Chipotle worker. That's crazy. That's nuts. <laughs> OnlyFans as a platform has more than 1 million registered content creators. So what do most of them earn? On average, only $180 a month. Now, you have to understand... I don't look down on people who do OnlyFans. I know people who do it. There are people that I love that do it. And so I'm not coming to the table looking at you with some stigma like, oh my God, you're on OnlyFans. But a lot of people do. A lot of future employers do. So if you're taking on that full stigma of like doing porn, because that's really what the stigma is. When someone says they do OnlyFans, you assume they are doing porn on there, right? Because that's what it's for, for the most part. So you're taking on that whole stigma you are limiting your ability to date healthily, to have a relationship with someone who loves you. You're ruining your future prospects of having a job for less than working at Chipotle. And this is just a reality people need to know. I mean, I people ask me all the time, Blair, why don't you do OnlyFans? First of all, can there be one trans person that exists that doesn't do OnlyFans? Do we all have to have an OnlyFans? Even Nikita has a, a, a goddamn OnlyFan that. It's like, do we do every single one of us have to be getting naked for money? I'm just not doing it. Sorry. I would actually rather work at Chipotle. 
That's not true. <laughs> if it ever comes down to me or Chipotle, I probably will do OnlyFans because I probably would kill it. But that's the point. That's the other thing the study factors in is that the people who are making the money on OnlyFans are people that are already famous or already have a built-in audience. So you guys are probably right when you tell me I would kill it on OnlyFans. I believe that I would. I'm a super niche. I'm trans. Like, I know that I look good as a trans woman and I have a huge audience. So I would kill it. But if you're just coming into that, without an audience, you're severely handicapped on your ability to make money. So I'm not saying it can't work out. I'm just saying more girls need to know the reality of it, which is that it's not always this like, now I'm making a hundred grand a month. It's like, you may be making less than Chipotle. In fact, that's the statistic, statistical likelihood. So just be real about it. You know what I mean? It's like, just, just be real. Because a lot of y'all are fake. You sit here talk about you're making six figures a month on OnlyFans and you're wearing Charlotte Russe shoes. It's just not, it's not adding up. It's not working. Texas House passes law banning child sex change. One Democrat breaks, breaks ranks to vote with the GOP. That's awesome. Um, it's really impressive. Let me read a little bit of this. Texas moved one step closer to banning puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and sex change surgeries in minors on Friday when the Texas House of Representatives voted 91 to 49 to advance SB 14, with Sean Theory being the lone Democrat to break ranks and vote in favor of the bill. It now heads back to the Senate for a final vote after a minor amendment was added to the House. The bill is expected to pass the Senate and advance forward to Governor Greg Abbott's desk, and I would assume Greg Abbott would make the logical decision of... Uh, allowing that to go through. It's very impressive, you know, the way that I've seen the right really mobilize on this issue. As much as I sometimes I'm like, man, the obsession that some people on the right have with trans shit is just so crazy. Like, do I have to see Dylan Mulvaney every time I open my phone? But at the same time, this is really the only thing in modern times of, you know, or the length of me paying attention to politics, which has now been about like probably a decade or so, that I've seen them mobilize in this way and get this much done because they don't get shit done. Republicans are largely useless. So seeing them actually put their mind to legislation, put it through, make shit happen, and it's now banned in several states is a good thing. And it's so crazy how every time one of these things goes through, I'll get DMs from people in the community and be like, are you regretting being a Republican yet? Look what they're doing. They're passing anti-trans bills in your state, in this state, in that state. And I'm like, all right, let me Google it. Every time it's, they're banning it for minors. Or in the case recently, someone came at me and was like, um, you know, Blair, I used to support you, but you've been really pushing for, you know, you know, against the trans stuff. And now look what's happening in Missouri. They passed a bill limiting trans adults. So I go and look and I'm like, I'm not for that if that's the case, but let me go look what happened. And it's a limitation that you have to go to therapy for a year to get hormones and surgery. And I don't even think it's necessarily in every case. I've been saying that kind of stuff my whole career, that you should go to therapy first. And a year sounds about right to me. That, that doesn't sound crazy to me. Go to therapy for a year before being approved to change your body forever? Yeah. I think we'd have a lot less people realizing they made a mistake if they had a year of therapy under their belts, right? It's like, so people want me to like be like deeply offended by like common sense legislation. And it's like the things I've been fighting for my whole career are finally happening and y'all want me to be upset about that. That doesn't make sense to me. Does it make sense to you? It's like if I was advocating for like, I don't know, if I was up here for, for seven, eight years on YouTube talking about fur is wrong, wearing fur is wrong, the fur industry is wrong, and then you see legislation finally being passed banning fur, I'm supposed to be like, oh my God, I can't believe I, I pushed for that. That's what I've been fighting for, for transition to be taken more seriously, for doctors to not rush people through, which is what they do. I didn't go to therapy before transitioning. I was rushed through the system. Let's just be honest about that. I walked into a doctor's office and 20 minutes later walked out with an estrogen prescription, which I have been on ever since. This was eight, nine years ago. So the fact that every person just like it's up to the luck of the draw, if it's the right thing for them, because there's almost no screening done anymore, is pretty nuts. 
right? It's like, so I lucked out. It was the right decision for me because I've always been the kind of person that, and the thing about trans people and people who think that they're trans is they always kind of say this, but it really is the case for me. It's like, I've always just known what was right for me. Like once I figured it out, I was like, yeah, this is what's right for me. And so I had the wherewithal to know what I was doing, but a lot of people do not. And those people don't deserve to be put through malpractice because they are indecisive or they don't have the full information, right? So in all seriousness, I should have gone to therapy. Maybe not me specifically, uh, but in general, people who are seeking to change their bodies forever should probably go to therapy first, dude. Like I even think like it shouldn't be mandated necessarily by the government, this one, but I think it's a good idea if you're a woman thinking of getting a boob job to have a therapy ap appointment or two first. See if you're doing it for the right reasons. Are you doing it because you want your husband to show you affection for the first time in 10 years? And you guys don't, you know what I mean? It's like, that's probably not the best reason because he should love you regardless. Are you doing it because you're insecure that everyone else in your family looks a certain way and you don't? That's probably a reason not to do it, right? So it's just like, I don't know. Shout out to Texas. Uh... You know, a lot of people didn't believe me when, you know, I got my surgeries done in Texas years ago. And I recently took my friend back to Texas, uh, back to my same surgeon to get her boob job. She's trans as well. She's an adult. And the receptionist was talking about how they were worried about, you know, the government of Texas making it harder or banning minors from doing it. And they've had them having to call 14 year olds to cancel their appointments for their double mastectomies. And I'm like, so y'all do double mastectomies on 14 year olds. And you're telling me that you're upset that you have to cancel on them because the government's making it harder to do that. And you want me to agree with that because I'm trans demented, demented. So it's been happening even in Texas and I'm glad that my state is taking a stand. This is, I'm, I'm proud to live here with this kind of legislation going through because it's common sense. It's in favor of children's rights. It's in favor of protecting children. And for you to want me to be mad about it, stick something somewhere, baby girl, baby boy, baby they, because I'm not upset about it. I'm happy about it. Listen. I told you guys that I wanted to like do a little segment where I'm just answering you guys' questions right now because news is slow and I wanted to talk to you guys. So I asked you on Instagram what questions you had for me and here are some of them. Are the men you date or sleep with gay or straight? Am I gay for thinking you're hot? <clears throat> so this is always an interesting one. And this... As with most trans topics, when you see people arguing about the, on, on the internet, you're just going to see a bunch of ignorance from every side. So the libs will say that being with a trans woman is straight, no matter what. It's straight. You're not gay if you, if you blow a trans woman. You're not gay. Conservatives will say it's gay all the time. It means you're gay. It means you're a gay man. Sorry to tell both of you. Both of you binary thinking assholes. But that's actually incorrect. Why do I know this? Because I actually live my life as a trans woman and I know the type of men that I attract. There's data to back this up, data you don't have because you don't live the life of a trans woman. I have never had a gay man pursue me sexually, romantically, approach me in a bar, approach me in the gym. Never. Now, do I think that having sex with or dating a trans woman is straight, I think it's its own sexuality. I think it's somewhere in between on the Kinsey scale. And I think that that's common sense. I think that if you have one person in this relationship, in this sexual encounter, whose body is nuanced in the sense of breasts and a penis and feminized elsewhere, but still born biologically male, that's inherently a gray area of sexuality. And I don't understand why I'm not one of these people who thinks that there's all this gray area with like sex, like biological sex itself. I don't think that there's 76 biological sexes. I don't think there's 87 genders, but clearly to anyone who's like ever lived in the world and met different types of people, sexuality is a spectrum. And so the reason people argue about this so much is that 
you're trying to place men who are attracted to trans women in the gay or straight box. Spoiler alert, maybe they don't fit in either one of those. First of all, you know bisexuality is a real thing, right? Like that's like a, a thing. There are people who like both. I don't know why people forget that. But even that's not necessarily an accurate description. I truly believe it is somewhere on the Kenzie scale. And wherever you want to place it, it's wherever you want to place it. But I don't think it's gay or straight. I think it's its own sexuality. And this is reinforced by the data I have in my life and my experience by the fact that every man I've ever been with has dated women and trans women. They have never dated a man. And here's where we're like, well, trans women are men. Okay, well, clearly the difference between Vin Diesel and me. And clearly there's going to be a difference between the type of person who is attracted to a Vin Diesel and a me. Right? So it's inherently nuanced and people aren't good with that. And I get that. <laughs> but um, I don't know. It's it just it's a gray area of sexuality. I don't think too much about it because it is what it is. Um, I just know that if, if I'm with a man who has only ever besides me been with women and sometimes maybe like one other trans woman looking at that person like they're gay when maybe they've had like marriages behind them or they've had this or that it's like that's not a gay man to me sorry doesn't mean the interaction is 100 percent heterosexual i'm not saying that but it's clearly something else and like that's okay i don't know it's it's, it's just interesting like sometimes i'll, I'll see this uh conversation happening on like twitter I'm tagged in all sort of like demented conversations on Twitter. Imagine my Twitter mentions. Imagine being me. It's like at any point I can just click on Twitter and see all these crazy conversations people are having about me, about my sex life, about this, with that. And like people are, some people like are so convinced that like gay men approach me or gay men want to bang me. It's like, do you know what being gay is? Do you know what being trans is? I don't think you do. Sorry. It, it really is its own thing in my head and, and from the conversations I've had with trans attracted men, it's its own thing to them as well. They don't, you know. Now, in terms of functionality in relationships outside of sex, in like society, I'm going to function as like a straight relationship because that's what on the exterior it appears to be. And with dynamics, like the relationship dynamics, it's way more on the straight side. Sex is something else. Sex is definitely closer to the gay side, but. So it's nuanced and people are so bad with that, but I hate that because I just feel like, I don't know, I hate binary thinkers. So that's the answer. It's its own thing. I know people want me to put it in one box or the other, but that's not like real life. So how did you become friends with Roseanne Barr? Love this unexpected friendship. Oh my God. Uh, let's put Rose I mean, the picture with Roseanne on the screen. Um, Roseanne's great. So she just moved to Austin, Texas. And we have a bunch of mutual friends. Uh, you know, she does sets over at Joe Rogan's club, the uh, mothership, the new club. And like, I've been there quite a bit. And uh, she had met Michael at the mothership and I wasn't there that night. And she had said that her and her son have been like following me for years, apparently know all about me. They're like fans. And I'm like, that's crazy. You never know who's watching. Um, so then a couple weeks later, we went out to a bar and we went out to the mothership and she did a set. And then the other day I went to her house and she cooked dinner for me and we just like drank and smoked and like hung out on her patio and like talked and it was super fun. So I love Roseanne. She's super sweet. She is everything that you would expect her to be just super funny. Um, every time I made her laugh, I would like take note of it. I'm like, I just made one of the funniest people laugh. Uh, so that was really fun, but shout out to Roseanne. What are your thoughts on Steven Crowder's divorce? Is he a monster? So Steven Crowder's divorce is like a big topic. And I don't give a fuck. Can I just say, I don't care about, I hate how social media and being and fame in general has like, Condition the internet to expect all this like dirt about people's personal lives and divorces. Like if you guys notice, I've like taken a huge step back from talking about like my personal relationships and like love life and all that shit because I think it's so toxic and you can see it here. It's like this expectation that when people break up all of a sudden they're like 
the next move is like trying to destroy each other's lives and like leaking court documents and like leaking ring videos, even if the other person is truly in the wrong. That to me is so demented. Now there's a ring video where he's treating her very badly and he looks very badly in it. And I watched that and I was like, what a fucking asshole. However, I don't know if you can judge a three minute clip out of a person's like decade or more long relationship with someone. I know that if you were to see three minutes of my life or my personal relationships, you could watch a 24 hour feed for a month and not get the full context of like my relationships. So why would I expect that you can with the Crowder thing? That being said, I think that Crowder is somewhat fair game to talk about in that sense because he is so pro-family values and talks about that and comes from a religious perspective about marriage. And so that does make it sort of on the table to talk about. Um, And that's a big problem with the right in general, by the way, is that none of these hoes live how they act. I'm talking about political commentators, not just people on the right. None of these hoes live how they act. The amount of demented people... Okay, I'll go off. You want me to go off? I'll go off. The amount of demented people that are in the right-wing commentary sphere is actually scary. Um, One thing that the libs do have correct, they're right about shit ever so rarely, but they're right about this. The, a lot of these, not all of them, but a lot of these pro-family values people on the right that become famous for that live like absolute monstrous degenerates in real life orgies, coke, secretly gay. That's another thing they're right about. These libs who think that a lot of these um, right-wing commentators who talk about gay stuff all day long are secretly gay, they're right. There's a lot of them. Actually, a shocking amount of them. And I'm never the type of person to out anyone. But when you hear about this one sending nudes to this one behind his wife's back, a man to a man, when you hear about um, this one uh, cheated on his wife with three guys, this one's doing that, and it's like all credible information and you just know it and some of them reveal it to you in person when they're drunk and talk about what they do. Nuts. Nuts. And it's like, this is why I really avoid mingling with these people, talking to these people, being at these events. It's like, I don't like what goes on at these events. There's a lot of hypocrisy. And it's just so funny because it's like the way that I'm talked about sometimes on the right is that like I'm the like degenerate of the commentators. I'm the one promoting like a, a, an effed up lifestyle. I'm the one like the I'm, I'm treated like the pariah or the like whatever. My lifestyle is so much more wholesome than so many of the of these like trad con family values conservatives that I've met. And it's just it's just hilarious to me. It's like. I'm over here like I've only ever been in like monogamous relationships, never cheated on anyone, like never done hard drugs, like never done some weird like sex stuff behind the scenes or like because the thing about these people that repress their homosexuality of the political commentators on the right is that it's not just that they are secretly gay and so on the side they're like doing stuff with guys. It's they do like immoral sexuality stuff with guys like it's talking like oh you're sending nudes to someone you're making an, a male intern a teenage male intern send you nudes to work for you as a man and you have a wife that's what i'm talking about like so when you repress that sexuality and you're just like projecting stuff all day long it's not just that you're going hooking up with dudes to get your fix is that you're doing really weird shady stuff that comes with like fucked up power dynamics and like it's like predatory right it doesn't come out in just you're just gay on the side it's like you're doing evil gay stuff um so it's it, i always just find it funny because i'm not saying that promoting a family values lifestyle is futile or wrong because i think that society needs that i just think it's so funny how a lot of these people don't live it um and i guess there's an argument to be made for like it's still a net positive to have them promoting it but it always does you know make it seem a bit silly when they get caught or when you know certain things behind the scenes. Um, And again, I would never out people and I just don't run my mouth about people using names, right? But I think people can read between the lines and see like a lot of like crazy immoral stuff happening. And that's not to say that there aren't, there isn't demon stuff happening with these left-wing commentators because I believe they're way worse. (laughs) Uh, But it is what it is. Let's see. 
what is the best and worst part of being such a well-known figure, especially with everything going on with trans right now? I would say the best part is um, I've had a lot of experiences that I would never have otherwise. So being at Roseanne's house the other day, having her cook for me, that's like, how is that real? <laughs> like, that's my life. Okay. And it's not a simulation. Okay. Uh, you know, it's like, I had like a simulation moment the other night. I was at um, Joe Rogan's club on the VIP balcony and I was looking and Ron White was next to me. Joe Rogan was next to me and we were watching Roseanne Barr on stage who I came to the club with. And I'm like, this is probably the coolest part, right? Just getting to not in a fan way, but just like interact with people you respect and be respected by people that you respect. Um, And then also little things like, not little things, it's a big thing. It's like, in November, I got invited by a member of Judas Priest to a Judas Priest concert. They gave me like backstage passes and everything. It's like that, how is life real? So that kind of stuff, the perks, the fun experiences, the people you get to meet, that's the best part of it. The worst part of it is probably specifically with the being like a famous trans person is that I'm used in conversations all the time that are highly uncomfortable and people just run their mouths about me in a way that's like just weird like just fucking weird like the other day I clicked on a podcast it was a podcast I've been on it was a podcast that I watch all the time I just clicked at a random point in the podcast right I literally clicked like maybe like an hour and a half into like a three-hour thing and they were in the midst of a debate about what bathroom I should use specifically me and there was people who I knew on the panel and I'm like do I have to be used as the example? I mean, I get it. And I would, and I get that on a career level, it is an accomplishment to, if trans is being talked about, Blair's name is coming up. Like that's a, an accomplishment. It's what I do this for. But at the same time, I'm like, sometimes I'm just like, I get uncomfortable with how much I'm talked about. Um, and then like later in that same video, they were talking about if it's gay or not to suck my dick. And I'm just like, maybe use a different example especially if you know me in real life and you're sitting there on a panel and there's just a complete removal from me as a person that you can talk about if it's gay or not to suck my dick. Like if someone brought up my friend and like their genitals, I'd be like, even if we're going to have this conversation, can we use a different example? Cause I know this person it's weird. I don't know. Sometimes it's just like too much. Um, I don't know if I really answered your question, but it just, it's just, it's just gets stressful. You know what I mean? And sometimes I get anxiety this is going to sound like I'm trying to like blow myself here, but I'm really not. Sometimes I get anxiety when I'm out in Austin just because more so than when I lived in LA, like more so I'm very like known here. And so sometimes I have anxiety about like specifically going out in Austin. This is going to sound like I'm trying to be big headed or like whatever, but I know my heart. I'm not um, more, so, way more so than LA. I am much more known here for whatever reason, the demographics of my channel and my social media. I have a lot of Texas people and like Austin's such a, like, it's just so known that I'm here because of like going on Rogan and, and with Roseanne, it's like, it's very known I'm here. And so sometimes going out stresses me out because I would say like 80% of the time, there's at least one person who comes up and it's not that coming up is stressful because I love my supporters and I love that. However, sometimes it manifests in weird ways. Let me give you an example. There was a guy that came up to me at the gym the other day and I haven't gone to this gym for like a year. Um, I go to like an old person gym. It's just like me and a bunch of old people, but there was a younger guy who like worked there and I had seen him like looking at me for like a year and my insecurity interpreted it for a year as this guy like clocking me as trans and like looking at me kind of like funny because of it and so I'd always get like a little insecure when he was around and I'd be like oh this guy like totally knows I'm like trans and like is weird about it he finally comes up and he's like he says he's been a fan for so many years so he for a it took him a year to work up the courage to say hi but because of that because of me always seeing him look at me funny I was like always feeling insecure in the gym right so it's not his fault at all and I'm not like oh, this person was a bad person. It was totally me in my own head. But that's an example of sometimes how it can be negative is that sometimes you don't want to be recognized or be seen and you just want to, especially it's like, I think I have a very specific look and, you know, it's like, but I'm not going to say I don't love when supporters come up because it actually does make my day. That's just one example of like when it can get kind of stressful, if that makes sense. Uh, Let's see. Next question. Let's see. 
will you vote for Trump again in 2024? If it comes down to that being the only option, absolutely. Um, but I'm a DeSantis bitch. You know what I mean? I just feel like DeSantis wields power in a much more effective way. Um, I don't necessarily want to vote for the king of the vaccine again. I don't necessarily want to vote for um, a president who handed off his presidency to Fauci at the end. Where's Fauci? I feel like I haven't even heard anyone talk about Fauci in like months and months and months. It's so weird. He's like not on the radar. It's so bizarre. But anyways, yeah, if it comes down to only Trump, for sure. All right, you guys, let's react to woke TikToks. And then I'll let you guys go. This person is non-binary, gender fluid, sometimes trans, and sometimes not. So let's see what the fuck this hoe's talking about. I'm non-binary, gender fluid, right? And within that, technically, by the definition standards, I am trans. Right. However, I'm not always like trans, you know, like I'm not always like I am trans, but sometimes I am like I am trans. And you know what I realized it is this, you know what I realized it, it is? Literally, it's that. Like li literally by being, oh, cool. That trunk opens like a door, not like a, oh, there's a cat. Oh, look at this, sweetie. There's a cat. Look at this. Okay. So sometimes I'm literally trans and sometimes I'm literally not. So cool for you. You get to turn it off like a light switch, bitch. I don't. I wake up trans. I go to sleep trans. I was five years old thinking about like why I feel this way. Good for you. Never have I seen a better representation of why trans should not be a fucking umbrella term that takes every confused person in, every person who feels like they feel some way this way and some way some days that way. No, you're not trans. You're never trans because if you're trans, you're not turning it on and off day to day. You attention seeking bitch. And I don't care if that sounds bad. I'm sick of you hoes ruining the credibility. It's it's ruined. It's they're not in the process of ruining it anymore. You have ruined any credibility trans people ever had by coming in talking about, well, sometimes I am and sometimes I'm not. That's not what it is. So so glad you get to turn it off. So glad when you're in a room where it's convenient to be trans, like your little leftist social circles, I'm sure you're very trans. And then when you go to work around whoever you're around, you get to be like, I'm not trans. Good for you, but you're not trans ever. And you need to know that. This, this is trans every day, right? This is, I walk into, especially now with trans being so public, I walk into every room as a trans person. And that gives me a right to talk about this shit like I know what I'm talking about because I do. You don't because you don't. So get it together. Get a personality. Get a hobby. Because that's really what you're lacking, right? You're picking up identities because you don't have hobbies, a passion, a career. And I promise that will not only be better for you, it'll be better for trans people when you just leave us to talk about our own shit ourselves. Because it's giving, it's give, it's, it's also giving performative the way like, she's like, oh my God, there's a cat. Oh my God, I'm just so quirky and ADHD and I can't keep focus. You're embarrassing. So it's a, you're also appropriating like people with ADHD. It's like your whole life is an appropriation. It sucks to be you, but like chill the fuck out. I get so mad on the, on the, um, Vogue TikToks, I don't know why. They just get me so heated because it's like, they are the problem. You cannot underestimate how much the, the and it sounds silly because it's such a funny phrase, the woke TikToks, no, they're actually serious. The woke TikToks have played a huge part in the downfall of the credibility of trans people. Like I would say one of the biggest parts. Okay, so Mother's Day is tomorrow and this is the second day that's rolled around. There's two different days in the year that I question. There's Mother's Day and there's Father's Day. As a trans person, as a trans woman, which one do I celebrate? Father's Day rolled around. I did. I don't feel like a father. Mother's Day is tomorrow. I feel like a mom, but who celebrates me? It's not a situation of pity me or anything. I just. just this is where I reached that crossroads of like, I can just be really mean, or I can be insightful and elevated or I can be both that voice 
That is the deepest voice I've ever heard in my life. Ain't nobody looking at you as mother with that voice. It's not giving mother. It's giving... I don't think I have a man in my life with that deep of a voice. I don't think even like the manliest like men I know have a voice like that. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, can cool people take back green hair? Because I would love if I could put some fun colors in my hair. Years ago, I experimented with putting like some little pink streaks. And even then, I felt just too much like a live. I didn't want anyone to get the wrong idea to think I was like a communist because I had pink streaks. So let's, I need y'all to do it first. The way I'm trying to fix the trans community from within the colored hair community, you got to fix your shit from within, bring it back, make it cool. Thank you. I'll join you if it's cool enough. However, I think it's sad this person realistically is like a, a parent and is like saying he doesn't feel like a father. I mean, it's like, I've said this before. I have nieces and nephews and like, they call me uncle and like, people think that's weird, but like, that's how they knew me when I was growing up. Like I was a teenager when they were very small children, right? And they saw me as uncle and I would never, I would never tell them not to call me that. One of them just says Blair, which is fine. Um, but like sometimes it says uncle and like they say uncle and I would never take that role from them. Do I necessarily fit that role based on my energy and how I am, whatever? No. But if that word is important to them, they can have it. So for this father to be on camera with this green hair and that stubble talking about, I don't feel like a father, how are your kids supposed to feel about you on camera talking about, I don't feel like a father? That's so foul. And it speaks to the narcissism of, let's just be honest, these AGP motherfuckers, these men who are attracted to men who have this fetish and are trans because of the fetish. That's not valid. I don't care. I don't, I, I don't feel that if you transition for sexual purposes that that's as valid as transitioning because of gender dysphoria i don't care don't care you're trying to get a nut off and i don't like that and do i know this person's attracted to women not necessarily but i do know it's a parent so i know that they made children with a woman uh i know that the energy is very much giving i fuck bitches so i'm gonna say this is pretty safe at this is an agp uh and so being on camera talking about I don't feel like a father for the sake of your fetish is demented and uh, the hair looks gross, but green hair could be cool if cool bitches took it back. You know what I'm saying? All right. That's it, you guys. I love you guys. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast as well as my main channel. I will see you in the next episode and I hope that all of you are doing amazing. <laughs>